Welcome to Wild Places. I'm your host, Brad Clement. This podcast is presented by Panji Foundation, saving snow leopards, helping communities. Mark Beckoff joins us today. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, just a little bit about your history so our listeners know uh, your background. You have been involved in conservation and animal science for many, many years. You've published, I believe, over 30 books. You're a yeah. former <laughs> Guggenheim fellow. You're a professor at University of Colorado Boulder, and you study uh, animal cognition and animal minds, animal behavior. You've been out there. You've seen it. You've done it. What, what started you down this path to begin with? Well, my path to where I am now was not linear. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I tried a whole lot of things and really, <coughs> excuse me, um, I kept homing in on animal behavior, not animal science per se, because academically ac- animal science would be programs that A&M universities, I mean, they could be good programs, but they usually advocate killing animals and they work for the dairy industry and the meat industries. So um, I'm really more of an ethologist and a behavioral ecologist. Um, my folks said that when I was three years old, growing up on the streets of Brooklyn, um, I used to talk to all the dogs and cats and mice and ants and birds. And they, <clears throat> I can't say they encouraged it, but they surely didn't discourage it. Mm-hmm. And I always used to mind animals. I, I, um, I never doubted they had active minds and I used to want to take care of them. And I wrote a book called Minding Animals based on a discussion I had had with my parents. And no, nobody who knew me back then, I surely didn't know me back then, um, is surprised at what I wound up doing. But mm-hmm. it wasn't linear. I was in, I was in a PhD MD program. I, um, I sold rock and roll records at, as the first job out of a, being an undergrad because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but I homed in, I think, what's in my genes and what's in my heart. And that's really, um, I'm pleased about that. So thanks for asking. And you have gravitated towards canines. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> after leaving the medical school program, because I didn't want to kill cats, and I, and I didn't, um, I went to work with a guy named Michael Fox at Washington University in St. Louis. I'd been an undergraduate there, but Michael wasn't there at the time, and he was studying canids, um, captive animals at the time, but um, wolves, coyotes, jackals, some dogs. um, And that's basically where I wound up wanting to do field work. And after doing my PhD um, in captive settings, if you will, I started doing field work, and I did a long-term field project of... um, wild coyotes in the Grand Teton National Park, Adelie penguins in Antarctica, um, and birds. When I lived in um, the foothills, I studied Stellar's jays and Western evening grosbeaks, um, all out of my living room. Cheap research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, uh, what is one of your best field study experiences? If you can go back over all those years, does something yeah. stick out? Um, the work in Antarctica was really amazing. It was at, it was before there were Lindblad and other tours. So we um, flew from Point Magoo uh, Navy Station in California to to um, at Samoa, to Christchurch, New Zealand, to Antarctica, <clears throat> and it was pretty barren. We spent a few days at McMurdo, which was really the landing place for all flights coming in from the United States Antarctic Research Program, USARP. And then we took a helicopter out to our field site. And um, there were four of us in a 10 by, yeah, I think it was an eight or 10 by 16 cabin, Mm -hmm. bunk beds, a little locker um, for the food. It it was considered a hardship post. So we had awesome food and wine. Um, (laughs) But it it, it was, it was literally being at the end of the world. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. really was, you know, we had, con- we were supposed to have contact with the base, I think every two days, but it, you'd go a week without it. I mean, it was frightening at times because we were really out of touch, but it was a really, it was otherworldly. 
That's all I can say. And we spent a few days and nights at different places where, to the best of our knowledge and the best of uh, the other researchers' knowledge, um, no human had ever been. So that was pretty cool. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So how does one person, how do you become so prolific and able to publish 30 books, over 30 <laughs> books? How does that happen? What's, what's that process like? Um, <clears throat> I love to write and read. Um, I can be very social, but I'm really sort of introverted. I, I, I can never get enough time at home mm -hmm. alone. <laughs> I mean, that's just who I am. Um, and I really love what I do. I don't consider writing and reading or even I taught at the University of Colorado for 32 years. Um, I hate to say that I didn't consider it work, of course, because they were paying me, but I didn't consider it work in, in the true, if you will, pejorative meaning of the word when people go, oh, God, I have to go to work. I mean, there were parts of my job I didn't like, but but I really love my I really loved what I did. And I love doing research and I love um, having superb um, graduate students. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it's just, a, it's just the way I relax. I mean, I just don't find writing to be particularly trying. <laughs> that, that's interesting. I, I've spoken with people, other authors, and some have described the process of writing and editing and getting everything published as just painful and just <laughs> excruciating. And it takes them three or four years to write one book. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting to hear you say it's, it's just part of who you are. It's a natural flow to who you are and what you love. And yeah, I mean, it takes, a, it takes a long time to write a book. Mm -hmm. We have a new book coming out with Princeton in the fall <coughs> called A Dog's World, Imagining the Lives of Dogs in a World Without Humans. So it's very timely. And, of course, we didn't just start it when the pandemic came. Um, but, you know, Jessica Pierce and I, it's our fourth book, and – even, even the both of us working really hard took two and a half years. So it's, I just don't, cons I mean, of course, there's parts of it that are tedious, but, but the overall process I, I, is wonderful to, to learn and to write and refine and, you know, maybe in one day write 20 pages and in one day write one paragraph. I was just writing something this morning because I write regularly for Psychology Today and I got a really nice essay down. And I made the fatal mistake of going back and looking at a paragraph that I didn't like. And I started doing it at one o'clock and literally five minutes before you and I contacted one another, I still had not made it through <laughs> an eight sentence paragraph. But, but once again, it just, it feels like it's in my genes. And I really mean that. I don't mean that in any la la, you know, bold or fluffy sense. I mean, yeah. I feel at home sitting and writing. I feel at home riding my bicycle a lot, which I do. Um, and I, I just don't mind the micro editing. I just do you, do you find you have a period of the day, morning or evening or midday, whatever it may be, where you're more creative and more able to write and, and evaluate your own creativity? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an early riser. I, I kind of wake up naturally at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. and. Um, fall asleep around nine or 10. Generally, I sleep well. And yeah, I like that time of the day. It's quiet. You know, I can get up, have a quick breakfast, check some emails or something like that, but it's really quiet. And then um, afternoons. Okay. You know, okay. At night, I, I catch what I can because I, after long bike rides and long periods of reading and writing and Zooming, <laughs> um, I'm fairly tired. Um, sure, sure. So over your years of experience and expertise, dogs in general, wild, domestic, what, whatever it may be, have you noticed anything just really special about who they are <clears throat> as, a, as a species? Is there, is there something that sticks with you, something that amazes you to this day about uh, dogs? A lot amazes me about dogs, but what um, I guess I was amazed years ago because I've really been studying dogs and their wild relatives for an awfully long time. Um, I'm still learning things. Um, and that's one of the things that amazes me is, you know, just when you think you've got it all knocked, 
something happens and you realize you don't. And I'm always fond of saying that the more I know, the more I say I don't know. Um, and in our coyote study um, in Jackson Hole at, at um, Blacktail Butte, right outside of Moose, Wyoming, I mean, after eight and a half years of, I mean, literally someone being out there almost every day, it was a good team. I had a full-time postdoc up there. We were still learning information after thousands of hours. So what it always intrigues me is how much diversity and variability there is out in nature, if you will, not only between species, but within species. Um, so that doesn't mean that research you know, isn't useful, but what it really means is that we need to sort of cool our jets and don't think that we're omniscient. I mean, I know a lot about coyotes and wolves and dogs, but like I said, a lot of times, even, you know, recently people ask me questions and I go, I have no idea. I just don't know why they're doing it. Um, so you're a professor, but you're also a, a student. You're, you remain a student. Constantly. I think that's why I, 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 you know, my friends, of course, knock me because they'll go, so when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> and, uh, you know, like sitting at home and writing and reading or, or you know, watching animals through spotting scopes or, or when I studied birds up in the foothills boulder at my house up Boulder Canyon. I mean, literally, my house was my field site for 12 years. You know, I had students coming up. I had research associates coming up. And I always was learning. So being this, I, I think being um, an, a lifelong student is great. Um, yeah. Moving into the conservation factor of, of animals in general, <clears throat> with, with your knowledge and all of your contacts and colleagues and this depth of experience that you bring to conservation, what, in your estimation, is the greatest risk to, to animals and whether they're endangered species or even uh, species like coyotes that, that are prevalent and, and thriving? Well, I mean, I know it sounds camp, but um, humans are, we, we are. I mean, we're a great threat to diver biodiversity, mainly because we've got big brains that allow us to do anything we want. We're arrogant. Um, we, you know, so many people practicing conservation still believe in human exceptionalism. I was just reading a few things this morning about, um, I, I'm a real fan of compassionate conservation and compassionate conservation really is founded on the principles of first do no harm and the lives of every individual matters. And that, if you will, that animals have a right to have their own lives. I don't, I don't talk a lot about animal rights. I like the word animal protection better because animal rights turns people off. But um, I think that when you begin to think about, you know, humans just trespassing wantonly into every single ecosystem, every almost every square inch of earth and, and water and air, by the way, um, we are the greatest threat because we're arrogant about it. And we think, I shouldn't say we, because I know you and I aren't in that camp, but you know, the royal we is that humans do pretty nasty things. Um, and a lot of times they, they sort of shoot and then they ask questions, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and my view would be that, and, and once again, you know, you can read it all over the place is, um, I'm a real optimist, but boy, over the last couple of years, I begin, I'm still an optimist, but I've, I've definitely at some points, you know, taken a deep breath and, you know, wondering if I'm also delusional. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you think humans, of course, we're animals too. We're, we're, yeah. we're yeah. right in there with everyone else. Uh, do you think it's a, you know, you're an optimist, but do you, are you starting to think it's a lost game that, that we as a species may not be able to pull ourselves out and, and help the world as opposed to just helping ourselves? You know, I don't think it's a lost cause, but I do think we're going to have to really shift around our goals and the way we go about doing things. You know, people romanticize the past, but in conservation, the past was a bloody past. I mean, conservation was basically killing other animals. I mean, it really was even, you know, lauded, 
conservationists um, didn't hesitate to um, harm and kill other animals in the name of conservation. But we're not going back to those times, I hope. And, you know, ecosystems and, you know, environments, including the animal residents, if you will, are dynamic systems. And they are adaptable and they, they, they can show a lot of elasticity and plasticity. But we are getting to the point in a lot of places where that the rubber band has stretched about as far as it can be stretched. And we are going to lose species. I mean, I'm not for it, but we are. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe new species will evolve, you know, in, uh, in the future. But I also think we need to take a very long term view, you know, like looking at what's happening today, whatever February, whatever it is today is useful. But we need long term views and we should be going backwards. I like to think of stepping backwards and taking long term views, say, from, you know, maybe 1900 to today, 120 years. Um, and then what it would be like in the future. But the future doesn't look as bright to me as perhaps the past few years or okay. past decades. Now, I've always found this fascinating about you. You're really good friends with Jane Goodall, but I believe that all began, weren't you roommates <clears throat> with Jane Goodall's former husband, like back in grad school days or something? You, you shared a tiny little apartment. Is, is that correct? There was some funny oh. story. No, that was Hugo Van Lewick. No, okay, we okay. We weren't roommates, but he used to visit me when I was a grad student at Washington University in St. Louis. And we used to have really great talks. And it was my first exposure to, you know, a world-class photographer who was sitting once on the bed in which he was sleeping, just tossing at the time slides on the floor. And then he held one up and he went, yeah, I like this. There were about 700 on the floor. And I said, well, well Hugo, what are you going to do with all of those? And he said, well, you can have them. <laughs> you know, I, I can't use them. Every one to the number was better than any picture I had ever, <laughs> ever taken. But at the time, Jane, it would have been the early 70s. She was give or take eight or 10 years into her study in Africa. Okay. Okay. And I knew about it because one of my, um, one of my uh, graduate student uh, office mates had gone off to uh, Gombe stream to, to study with Jane. Mm -hmm. but, but, but my interactions with Hugo were great because I had not yet been to Africa. And I just wanted to know what it was like. What is it like to be around hyenas and wild African dogs and chimpanzees. So he, he just, he was full of stories and stuff. And then subsequently, of course, I had heard of Jane, I met Jane and, mm -hmm. you know, we clicked on a number of different issues. So we wrote a book together and I do a lot of work with her Roots and Shoots program. Yeah. And, and the Roots and Shoots, that involves children in conservation and, and Most helping. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been teaching a Roots and Shoots class at the Boulder County Jail for 20 years. Okay. And so um, it's now in refugee camps. It's, it's really, um, I, I taught a course, I, I taught at the uh, Golden West um, Assisted Living Center um, as well. One day, I, one day I did a Roots and Shoots group for four to six year olds and octo and centenarians. I literally within an hour went from interacting with a kindergarten class in Boulder to <laughs> dealing with these wonderful people who were 80, 90, and one guy was 100 years old um, talking about animals. Yeah. And some of their grandkids were in classes that I was teaching <clears throat> at, at the university as well as at uh, middle and elementary schools in Boulder. What is it like to work with prisoners and, and educate and, and help them learn? And how, how does that work? And, and do you feel a sense of accomplishment uh, dealing with such an unusual, if you will, population of, of students. Yeah, it's been among the most rewarding things I've done. I really mean it. Um, a lot of them are much more closely attached to non-humans and humans for a wide variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. A lot of them grew up having very bad childhoods and their best friends were dogs, cats, snakes, lizards, a monkey for one of them. and and. The, the basis of the course was that um, we could learn a lot of lessons from, from non-human animals in terms of how to resolve conflict. 
So when I contacted the jail mm -hmm. 20, 20 or so years ago, you, they were wonderful, but they said, you, you want to do what? You want to teach a course on animal behavior? And I said, yeah, let me, let me talk to you about it. You know, Jane and I had talked about it because it was a roots and shoots group in actually on death row in a California state penitentiary. And Jane said, why don't you go teach at the jail if there's a local jail? And so they laughed, but they said, okay. And I learned a lot. I mean, one of the things I learned is that no jail is a country club. Some people used to say, ah, Boulder County Jail is a country club. No, it's not. I, I always say to them, be my guest, spend a night there. You know, and even on the local level, Boulder County jails got people from pickpockets to murderers. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's a it's 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 like a prison, and made, one of the only differences is maybe the length of time that people reside there. But I've learned really quickly how animals soften these guys. I don't. I teach men, and um, they do beautiful artwork and prose. Some of their artwork has um, won awards that art festivals to which I've submitted them. They've written a number of essays, some of which I've published on Psych Today and in other magazines. And I, and I think what I really learned too was that everybody really, everybody has something to contribute. I mean, I, I, I can revise that based on the last four years of politics here, but it's okay to give people a second chance. Mm -hmm. um, but, but from the animal point of view or the human animal interaction point of view, the one theme that came up all over and over again was the more they learned about non-humans, the more they wanted to know about non-humans. Some of them I know went on to take jobs working at either the Humane Society locally or doing field work, you know, for research projects. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and some of them went back to school, got master's degrees. I know that. I run into some of them in the streets, and they're they're so proud of what they've done. Mm -hmm. But the softening effect of non-humans that you know a lot of them would get a lot they get a lot they get a lot more upset when they read about violence to non-humans than humans. And I don't mean that in an, any derogatory way at all. Sure. Because they would look at non-humans as marginalized, a marginalized group of people, just like they are. So Pangee Foundation, you know, a lot of our work is focused on children and school kids mm -hmm. and helping them become the next generation of conservationists, stewards of, of biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what I find really interesting is you're talking about all ages. And even people who have been a little disenfranchised through through being prisoners, and yet, to your point, they they have a second chance. And your lessons that you teach and and promote conservation and animals, it's really helping them from all ages, from from a hundred year olds to to school kids to to guys who have maybe uh, committed really serious crimes. <coughs> mm -hmm. But the lessons of compassion and conservation really have affected people from all age groups. I, I think that's really neat and something that shouldn't be understated. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But yeah, that's exactly how I look at it. I mean, when I went to the assisted living center, you know, there are people there who are pretty lonely. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of them have outlived their entire families, for example. Um, also, a lot of them have so much wisdom. I, I just, I love talking to these people. I mean, I knock on some wood that I don't have here. I've got some good longevity in my family too, but some of the 95 and 100 year olds mm -hmm. were lucid and were telling me stories about their upbringing, uh, stories about, you know, the companion animals with whom their grandchildren, great grand and great, great, great grandchildren live with. And they loved being able to express themselves, giving them voice. And that was one of the things that I learned right, uh, right away um, at the jail was for a lot of these people, no one ever listened to them. Mm -hmm. So they'd write things and I'd publish it. They'd do drawings that won awards. I mean, I mean, seriously. And, and the jail was very happy, the jail administrators, and, and they still are. I mean, I'm probably the longest running volunteer there. Yeah. Uh, but 
And I haven't been able to go for a while because of the COVID pandemic. And I miss him, but I go mm -hmm. by there and drop movies off. Um, I brought them some gifts. Um, I, it, it's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Joan Baez on some projects now, and we've been talking and emailing mm -hmm. and texting about them. And, you know, if you talk, we want to talk about a champion of social justice. So I asked her, can I please say hello to the guys at the jail for you? And she was thrilled that I did. Um, they they need they love and need the attention because the positive attention because the only attention many of them have gotten has been negative or no attention at all. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like to me that you have gained as much as maybe gained more than what you've given. I, I'm watching you on screen right now, and your eyes light up when you talk about helping these people. And what's funny is you're helping them through this passion you have for animals and conservation. And it's just a really neat circle uh, that, that you gain as much as you give. Oh yeah, I actually felt some withdrawal over the first couple of months of not going, you know, not being able to go into the class. Mm -hmm. And I have, and that's why I've stayed in touch with them. You know, I get emails from some of them, not, not when they're incarcerated, but I'm in email contact with some of them. And I see them walking down the streets of Boulder not too long ago, one of the great artists. I mean, this guy is so skilled. I ran into him. He'd been out. He was doing okay. And um, we had a really nice chat. And um, he's starting a website. I would take their drawings. I'd mount them. I'd scan them. And I'd just give them back to them. And um, one of them, I am told, I um, was influential in him not taking his, whole, his, his own life. And okay. Um, and yeah, so I, I would like to say it's a balance, but sometimes I feel I'm getting more out of it than they are. But, but I think, I think the, the resolution line is one of equality. Nice. Nice. Going back to just pure animals and, and species at risk. Is there one thing that humans could do every day to just help a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, the, my, my sort of global recipe for what we can do or what's available is to accept other animals for who they are. And, and I don't mean that in some la-la fluffy way. You know, around Boulder, people move into the mountains and for a couple of months, they, they brag about having cougars and bobcats and black bears at their home. And then they, and then they want them caught, captured and moved. <laughs> and and I've tried to get some realtors to tell their potential clients about the local fauna, and only one has ever even agreed to talk about it. I understand why from a business point of view, but I think we really just need to be much more accepting of our place in nature and the fact that we are so um, we are so ubiquitous. We're all over the place, and we can do whatever we want. And just to be a bit more humble and show a little more humility. And it's okay if you don't want to live in the presence of non-humans. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you move into their, into their home range of territory and you trespass, you should be more accepting. And when I lived in the mountains, um, on occasion, I felt badly for living where I did. I did not build the house in which um, I lived. Mm -hmm. And I just decided flat out, maybe because of what I do is... These animals are welcome around here. So I had to change my ways. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'd wake up and there'd be a cougar sitting on my front porch or a black bear once was sitting on the, my deck and I couldn't leave the house to get to the airport for an international flight. And, and he finally moved. I kept yelling, would you please just go for five minutes? I need to walk 50 meters to my car. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the pandemic, because of all the neighbor, new neighbors coming in, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. the animals coming back home, if you will, um, I'm hoping that that will generate uh, more tolerance for our new non-human neighbors. And I think it is, in some places it is, because, because they also spark the interest of people who are bored to hell because they're stuck at home. You yeah, know, you, interesting, interesting. You work yeah. at home. And I would have friends who say, you're so lucky you work at home. I just want a week at home. Well, after a week at home, most of them couldn't wait <laughs> to, to get back to work. Right, right. Um, 
You know, it's funny you mentioned how you know, animals within our own neighborhoods, certainly around here in Boulder, where we both live, they've become more prevalent since the pandemic and since people aren't moving around as much. And I remember it's probably been a year when when this whole COVID pandemic first began and we yeah. were first staying at home and really locked down tight. I remember seeing photos on social media, downtown Boulder, out of nowhere, mountain lions just started showing up in broad yeah. daylight, yeah. bears hanging out in trees uh, <clears throat> next to the high school. And it was neat to see how quickly these animals can acknowledge a change in human behavior and adapt so quickly and feel a sense of safety in knowing that suddenly humans aren't around as much. Yeah, I mean, on average, they're trying to avoid us as much as we're trying to avoid them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had three encounters in the mountains. I was like an arm's length from cougars, not, not intentionally. Yeah. And I survived it. And I had a great working relationship with a black bear cub. Um, and we got to the point where he would watch me from about 15, 20 meters, sometimes closer, and I would watch him. And we really worked things out. I mean, I, I, I felt safe walking up to my car. I used to have to go up steps or around my driveway to my car. I felt safe um, riding my bike down to Boulder and back um, up the canyon and up, up the dirt road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I never took it for granted. And one day I was riding up, it was a pretty steep hill off of uh, Boulder Canyon to my home. And I turn around and I see this bear charging down the hill. And I'm thinking, now this isn't really good. I just ridden about 60 miles. I was tired and I couldn't have outridden him anyway. <laughs> but he got really close to me. I don't know who it was. I don't know if it was the bear with whom I was familiar. And I just pedaled hard and just said, go. And he actually stopped in his tracks. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he stopped because he understood go away, but it made that sense of vulnerability made me very uneasy. And I'm not, I'm not totally, um, I'm not a, I'm, I'm fairly risk averse. I, I, I'm not a risk taker. And what that incident did to me after many, many years was it made me realize I'm still living where their ancestors lived. Mm -hmm. And if I choose to ride my bike down the road or choose to hike down the road with my dogs, then I'm vulnerable and understandably so. Um, Through all your years of work, and, and I bring this up because you just said, you know, you said, basically said stop and the bear stopped. Now, who knows if he, <clears throat> if he knew what, what you had just said. But in all your years of working with animals, studying animals, research, do you think animals in general, and we can go back to dogs, but, but just animals in general, do you think their cognitive abilities are, are more or less than we, we, again, the royal we, generally give them credit for? Oh, I think their cognitive and emotional capacities are off scale richer than most people give them credit for. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been doing this stuff for a really long time. And like I said, I'm still learning. Sometimes I see things like even at dog parks where I've spent countless hours because that's what I get paid to do. There's rarely a time I go to a dog park or I see a coyote out on a ride or, um, you know, a black bear around town or even where I live or a cougar where I don't see something I never saw before. Mm -hmm. You know, so so one of my big things about dog behavior, especially is that <clears throat> when people say, oh, dogs don't feel guilt or dogs can't do this or don't do this. I'm thinking, well, the only dogs these people have watched are dogs in laboratories. You know, I had students studying free ranging and feral dogs in the Four Corners and on some of the Indian reservations and in Mexico. I mean, these dogs are amazing. So from a dog's point of view, they're being short sighted because um, most studies of dogs are done on home dogs and home dogs only represent about a quarter of the dogs in the world. People don't realize that, that there's give or take 900 million to a billion dogs and probably 700 million or so are free ranging or feral. You know, wow, wow that's own. a tremendous percentage. It's huge. I, I'd people never thought realize, about that before. Yeah, people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, the question about, you know, like, am I still amazed by a lot of these things Oh, I am. And sometimes I, you know, 
I wrote an essay recently, you know, I'm just trying to think people say, well, dogs don't do this, or they don't have the capacity to learn certain skills. And I'm thinking, my God, just go to a dog park. I mean, when I've studied, um, years ago, I studied free ranging dogs living around Nederland and Rollinsville when I lived up there. So they were free ranging, most of them went home at night. But you know, back, back in the 70s, living in the mountains, you know, there were, there was nothing there. I lived in Nederland, you know, there were yeah. no bus services, no banks or anything like that. There were packs of dogs mm -hmm. and I never had a problem with them, but it was almost like people would just let them out. They'd hang out and then they'd know to go home. Yeah. And um, you'd see the most amazing things. I mean, you know, in terms of their cognitive abilities, in terms of their emotional capacities, in terms of how they, if you will, talk to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lab studies are done on lab animals and, and I'm not criticizing the research per se, because a lot of the research is really good. But what I'm critical of is the fact that generalizing that dogs do or don't do this from a dozen dogs studied in a lab. And, and like I said, really to the very last day in the field, after eight and a half years around Blacktail Butte in Jackson, Wyoming, we were still learning things. We, we, I mean, literally learning things to the last minute. And sometimes projects just, just end. Um, and they did, they did, but people have, you know, studied uh, coyotes in other places and subsequently added to our database. Great, great. It sounds to me like you're not exactly slowing down anytime soon. What What's next for you? What, what, what is your path looking like? How is your journey going to continue? Um, <clears throat> well, like I said, we have this book coming about out about what, how dogs will do in a world without humans. And, and, you know, the book's done, we have to copy edit it. And, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interviews. Um, thinking about writing a book on compassion and conservation, because I think that's the wave of the future. Um, mm -hmm. For me, killing's off the table. No more killing. And people go, oh, but that's a hard and fast rule. The problem is, is if you say, well, you can kill in this harm or kill in this situation, but not that situation, you get on this slippery slope. Invariably, um, people who take that view will find reasons and situations in which they can rationalize killing other animals. I can't. So I just decided that I am saying killings off the menu. And so writing about it, and, and I've talked to a lot of people who have been conservationists for years, who've been involved in projects where animals are harmed or killed, either to help other members of their species or to help members of other species. And by and large, they all agree it doesn't work in the long run. You know, it's a and when I say it's a feel-good situation, I hope none of these people feel good or else they'd be sickies. But um, it makes you feel like, you know, oh, yeah, I've got a quick fix to a problem, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's that's really where I'm going now. I mean, it really is. And, and I think there's a lot more to be said about um, approaching conservation projects from the point of view of all stakeholders, the non-humans and the humans, if you will, and even e ecosystems or stakeholders. I mean, what I love about Compassion and Conservation is it's just offering a really complete picture of, say, the world out there. And, and it's making people think because every now and again, I'll hear a talk about people talking about ecological niches or in the environment, and they don't mention the animals. And I, I'm always pretty well known to say, well, oh, oh, by the way, these places have residents, non-humans and humans. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they'll say, is, oh, yeah, we know that. And I'm going, well, I don't know that you know that because everything you're doing is so anthropocentric and or human centered. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not factoring in the lives, the lives and the hearts and the minds of these non-human residents. And okay. I, I think people are really, I think there's a change slowly, but globally where people are realizing that invasive and just bloodletting conservation is not the way of the future. And I'm, I'm offered a lot of hope by, um, you know, grad students and younger researchers who want to learn more about the world, but do not want to harm animals mm -hmm. as they learn about them. Yeah. Where can people learn about you? Where can people find out 
more about you, your books, uh, the work with Roots and Shoots? Well, if they really want to learn about me, they can go to my homepage, markbeckoff.com. Um, I write regularly for Psychology Today, and I love that platform because it gets to the non-converted. I, I, really, I really enjoy writing for them. Um, they give me some latitude, but, um, but, but I think for me, I want to talk to people who aren't in my camp. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that's happening in Colorado with our wonderful governor, Jared Polis, and his partner, Marlon Reese, is I'm on the Governor's Coalition for Animal Protection. So I, I, uh, I talk to Marlon all the time, and a lot of times Jared jumps in on the conversations. But, but um, two other people and I are advisors on animal protection. And one of the key issues we're dealing with now um, is the potential reintroduction of wolves into Colorado. Right. And we're talking about that, I mean, as recently as this morning, to be honest with you. So I'm, I think that, I think, so it would be more for Colorado residents, although I, you know, any reintroduction program of a carnivore has a lot of international um, appeal um, and gathers a lot of uh, global attention. Um, but that program itself is raising a lot of the questions you and I are talking about is, you know, what right do we have to interfere in the lives of these animals? Should we be bringing wolves back to Colorado or should we allow them to come back on their own if they choose to? Mm -hmm. um, and when you start thinking about questions like that, they instantaneous blossom, inst instantaneously blossom into really good discussions. So, um, that's something that I think is going to be taking up a lot of time and it's time well spent. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's always, always a fun conversation with you. And, thank you for uh, look, your interest. Look forward to the next time we see each other in person. But until then, yeah. huge thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Ben. All right. 